Our first speaker is Professor Simon Lewis. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Simon. Professor Simon Lewis is Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Sydney and an NHMRC Leadership Fellow. He is the director of the Parkinson's Disease Research Clinic at the Brain and Mind Center and heads the New South Wales Movement Disorder Brain Donor Program. He has published over 300 peer review papers, two books and eight book chapters and has attracted over $10 million in funding from various sources, including the NHMRC, the ARC and the Michael J. Fox Foundation to support his research interests which target the quality of life in neurodegenerative diseases. So we are really um, honored to have Professor Simon Lewis talk to us. He is doing a virtual talk, but we, we have tested the system. He will be able to listen to us and you are free to ask him questions after the talk. So thank you, Simon. Thank you so much for the very kind invitation. Hopefully people can hear me um, because of the presentation mode. I won't be able to see things typed into the chat box. So if there's a problem, just speak to me and then I'll, then I'll know to stop talking and reset something. So um, uh, thank you very much indeed for the very kind invitation to present. Hopefully next time I'll get the opportunity to come in person. Um, I want to congratulate you, Arup, on uh, putting together something that's wonderful like this. A public forum is, is vital uh, for our community. Um, you'll see on the slide uh, that hopefully is being presented on the screen, uh, there's a QR code there for my website. Um, the website has basically got over 100 videos of me just talking to the camera about a variety of things, including uh, today's lecture I'll record and I'll throw that up on the website as well. So if you've got the QR code, you'll be able to see that. Um, what I thought I'd do with today's presentation is speak about clinical trials, um, because I think a lot of Parkinson patients want to know what's going on um, in terms of us trying to work stuff out to make your lives better. Um, it would have been easy in some ways to do a different lecture talking about the um, how we treat non-motor symptoms, um, but I've actually already recorded that on my website. So again, you'll see a QR code there. So if you wanna hear how we go about treating things that are, if you like, are not the physical symptoms of Parkinson's, so not the slowness, the tremor, the stiffness, the wearing off, the dyskinesia, but the things like memory and psychosis and fainting and bladder and bowels, this video recording has a number of uh, tips uh, for treating those things. But as I say, what I was going to do today was really focus on um, the sort of recent studies that hopefully we can bring into practice and you can start doing already. Um, I don't really have any major conflict of interest uh, for this presentation, except that it'll be very fast, which is why I'm recording it so you can go back and revisit it. So hopefully we'll have a bit of time at the end for questions. So when we talk about non-motor features, we're really talking about all of those things that you can see on the slide there. And we're going to um, talk about a number of uh, uh, studies that have targeted um, all of these things uh, in various degrees. The, the fact of the matter is that most patients with Parkinson's disease will get some, if not all, of these features. It tends to change through the course of the disease. So Early on in the course of the disease, you wouldn't expect things like fainting or bladder disturbance, but certainly in more advanced cases, we see a lot more of that. Um, but what we're going to do is sort of break it down into um, topics that I think will be of interest to you, um, and, um, and hopefully we'll have time for questions, as I say. So the first study I want to talk about is close to everyone's heart in support groups, and that's the use of cannabis, or in this case, medicinal cannabis. So this is a study published uh, recently, which basically said, hey, we know that Parkinson's patients have a range of these non-motor features or non-motor symptoms, um, whether it's anxiety, whether it's poor sleep, whether it's psychosis, where they you know, get hallucinations or delusions or cognitive impairment. Um, and what this study said was, OK, let's find patients who've got some of those problems and, and try them with, uh, with medicinal cannabis and see if their problems get better. And this study was interesting because what they did was they said to themselves, OK, well, before we just give uh, the standard approach with a trial where half the patients would get the study drug and half the patients would get a placebo, we should try all the patients on the study drug, make sure they're safe uh, and then blind the study from that point on and half will get the drug and half will get placebo. Now, there are difficulties with this, especially in the world of cannabis, because cannabis or medicinal cannabis can alter the way that you feel. So you might actually realize that you're not on the sugar pill. 
So that's a tricky thing. But in this study, what they did was they approached 47 patients with Parkinson's disease who had troublesome non-motor symptoms. And they tried to, uh, if you like, test them out and see if they were going to be OK with medicinal cannabis. And then of those ones, 47 who uh, tried it, uh, they then were able to randomize them to either get sugar pill or drug. And what the study showed uh, was quite nice in that it said, well, OK, it does appear that, that medicinal cannabis can help those non-motor symptoms. So that's a, a, a big win. That's a nice thing to know. But if you look at what's actually happened here, of those 47, only 19 were put into the study. And then sort of 10 went in one group and nine went into the other group. So pretty small numbers. But the thing that's really important is the fact that of the 47 who they tried to get into the study, most of them had side effects from taking medicinal cannabis and therefore weren't included in the study. So this is really important because everyone in clinic says to me, oh, I've heard cannabis could be good for my Parkinson's. Well, be careful because there are some problems here. It might help with things like anxiety and sleep. But the fact of the matter is that we do see common side effects. And this is a nice study from colleagues in Israel who again looked at Parkinson's patients with medicinal cannabis. And everyone goes, oh, medicinal cannabis, that's safe. It isn't safe because what happens with medicinal cannabis is that the cannabis, uh, synthetic cannabis gets broken down into other cannabinoids and they react to the brain. And if you look at this list from an Israeli study, what they're saying is that 17%, nearly one in five patients who take medicinal cannabis will get confusion, anxiety, hallucinations. So not very safe. And in actual fact, if you looked at any side effects, feeling dizzy, feeling worried, feeling whatever, you'd see actually 60% of people taking synthetic cannabis actually get side effects. So a real sort of note of caution. So what about some of the other problems specifically? So cognition and dementia. So this is a study from Japan. And what they did was they said, well, look, we know Parkinson's affects the dopamine system and gives you the slowness and stiffness, but we also know that there are other neurotransmitters that get impacted, including the cholinergic nervous system, which we don't talk about very much. And we have drugs to target that system. And what this study did was to say, well, if we targeted those neurons that are cholinergic, could we change the risk of getting dementia in the long term? Because these are tablets we can give to people with poor memory, so we know that they're pretty safe. And the Japanese doctors thought perhaps it might actually also modulate inflammation in the brain because the cholinergic system has been implicated there. So in this study, what they said was, OK, we're going to take people who oh, aren't demented with Parkinson's disease and half of them were going to give a drug that targets the cholinergic nervous system at time of you know starting the trial. And half of them will wait for about 18 months and then give them the drug to see if it helps reduce their risk of dementia. And the idea is that if the drug works to reduce your risk of dementia, then the ones who've had it from the get go and have had longer period treatment should have a lower rate of getting dementia. And quite frankly, the study was well conducted, but it didn't show any benefit. So we haven't got a drug, it would seem, that would reduce the risk of getting dementia in the future. In actual fact, potentially more side effects. So that's kind of interesting. There is, however, this other drug, uh, Bacarmacine, uh, which has got the other name, which is um, Anavex 273. And, and this is a drug that um, has been trialed um, in Parkinson's patients with dementia. And this is a study that was mainly done in Spain, but there were centers here in Australia, including my own, and I think um, Victoria had some too. Um, and effectively, this is a drug that targets that cholinergic nervous system, but also is thought to maybe reduce some of the stress on the cells that are dying uh, in Parkinson's disease. And the investigators of this drug um, reported that in the study looking at Parkinson's dementia, they did see improvements in memory and also physical symptoms. Now, what's really interesting is that this data has not yet been published as far as I know. It's on the company's website and it's over 18 months ago that this came out. So it's very odd that it's taking so long, but I, I would uh, suggest that this drug has also been trialed in Alzheimer's dementia patients. And I believe that they are looking to um, submit a paper showing some benefits in Alzheimer's dementia. So it may well be that they're focusing on that first uh, and then perhaps gonna get around to publishing this paper. But there is hope here of something that's new 
Um, and, and actually, through a special scheme, it might even be possible to access it here in Australia. So a treatment for Parkinson's dementia. So that's that's something you probably didn't know about before you came in this morning. What about other treatments for dementia? Well, you're all probably familiar with deep brain stimulation. And this is a treatment that we've had now for probably 30 years, where electrodes go deep into the brain and target really physical symptoms, either tremor or mostly it's for patients who their tablet works for a couple of hours and then the benefit is lost and their Parkinson's comes back. So we put these electrodes into the brain, stun the part of the brain that's, if you like, causing the, the slowness and the stiffness and the tremor and hopefully relieve the symptoms in a way that you don't rely on your tablets and therefore you get benefit physically. But again, looking at this other part of the brain, the cholinergic nervous system, um, this is in a group of investigators in, in London, including my old mate Tom Fultony, um, who said, well, if we can put the electrodes and stimulate those cholinergic neurons, perhaps we could improve memory in people with Parkinson's dementia. So this is a very small study, only six patients who went into this study. Um, and what they did was they actually put the electrodes in all of them and then tested them with the electrodes switched on and with the electrodes switched off to see if there were any benefits. And frankly, there were no improvements in cognition. So it's a very small number of patients, so it's hard to overinterpret. But it doesn't look as though deep brain stimulation will actually improve cognition in Parkinson's disease even specifically targeting this part of the brain. Probably some of the most troubling symptoms, uh, I think that are non-motor uh, relate to psychosis. So this is hallucinations where you see things that aren't real or delusions where you believe things that aren't real. It's a very limited repertoire. So people are breaking in, they're stealing my stuff. People are poisoning me. My wife's having an affair. She isn't who she says she is or seeing things like animals or people. And these are really the leading cause of people ending up in a nursing home. So it'd be great to have some better treatments. And interestingly, this is a, a meta-analysis. And so this is where a group of doctors based in the Netherlands have analyzed all of the data that's out there for a drug that we've had for probably 20 years plus to treat dementia in Alzheimer's. And in other parts of the world, it's used to treat dementia in Parkinson's disease. And again, it's targeting that cholinergic nervous system. And, and, and it's a drug that we're not really allowed to use here in Australia for this purpose, but there are ways of prescribing it. But interestingly, what these um, investigators did was they looked at all the drug trials that had evaluated um, this type of drug, what's called a cholinesterase inhibitor, so targeting the cholinergic nervous system. And they looked at Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And we'll focus on the Parkinson's data, but what they showed um, was not only does this drug seem to help with some memory aspects in Parkinson's disease, but actually also reduces some of these um, psychiatric, uh, psychotic features, so delusions and hallucinations. So in actual fact, this is a drug that isn't commonly used. It's relatively safe compared to the drugs that we use at the moment. So at the moment, if somebody develops delusions and we're trying to control it, we don't really have any drugs that are licensed here in Australia. What we tend to use is lower doses of the drugs that the doctors who treat schizophrenia uh, and those sorts of patients. So we use the sort of drugs that are used for schizophrenia in much lower doses. And those drugs are, are pretty well tolerated and, and generally safe. But we know that there is a slight increased risk of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular death. So it's, it's hundreds of thousands of patients you have to study to see this. But there are these associated risks with these antipsychotic medications. But what these doctors from the Netherlands are showing is this drug, a cholinergic targeting drug, um, which is typically used um, for dementia, does seem to also benefit some of the psychotic features that we can see in Parkinson's, like delusions, like hallucinations. So again, a treatment that isn't being commonly used, I suspect, in practice, although I've been using it probably for over a decade for this purpose. Okay, the other drug which I talk about briefly in relation to psychosis is a drug called pimavanserin. And pimavanserin, or Nuplazid is the trade name, I think, um, is a drug that basically this study was done nearly 10 years ago. And it's a, a different type of drug. It doesn't target the cholinergic nervous system. It targets the serotonergic nervous system. And in the, the original study nearly 10 years ago, they showed in patients with Parkinson's who had psychotic features, there were improvements in these psychotic features. Now, what's happened since then 
is that it hasn't been widely used because the drug is quite expensive. So in America, where the drug is available, it doesn't seem to have been taken up. And it doesn't seem to have been taken up by any of the drug companies who would take it to the rest of the world. So it isn't actually available here in Australia. So this is an interesting drug. Um, the fact of the matter is that there was some concern that it might also increase the risk of death, a bit like the other antipsychotic medications that are out there. The reviews really don't show that strong signal. So it's a drug that at the moment could be useful, but unfortunately isn't here, probably mainly because of cost. Um, so this is a real challenge because trying to get drug companies to bring a drug to market can be very expensive. So they're not usually uh, rushing to do that unless they know they're going to make a profit from it. What about the um, mood aspect? So mood in Parkinson's disease, we're really talking about depression, anxiety, and apathy. So depression, flat mood, um, you know, feeling low, anxiety, worrying about things where you shouldn't be worrying, and apathy, losing that drive to do things. And they're very challenging symptoms. They'd affect probably at least 40% of patients. Uh, and so they're, they're, they really are a problem. Typically, we can use... Um, the normal antidepressant treatments. So the drugs that we use for someone with depression or anxiety seem to be pretty well tolerated in Parkinson's disease, but of course they act on the brain. So in actual fact, they do run the risk of side effects like increasing sleepiness, like triggering confusion or hallucination. So it would be nice to be confident about other treatments. And actually this is a study which I think is really important showing that actually um, behavioral therapy for depression. So this was on a telephone. Um, so basically patients were um, identified with Parkinson's disease who had depression. Um, and then they were randomized to either get a counselor on the telephone or treatment as usual. So they were basically just you know, comforted and, and made sure that they weren't gonna run into too many problems. Effectively, the, the intervention here was 10 sessions on the telephone of cognitive behavior therapy. So this is giving people strategies to deal with their depression. And it ran over um, three months, so basically every week. And then after the first uh, three months, it was every month uh, for a six month follow up period. So it's quite intense, but effectively no drugs so no potential for side effects there. Um, the therapists that they used were actually not qualified. They were master's level. So they were actually students who were working under supervision. So if you like, this is a way that you could multiply the effect or the benefit because you don't have to have hundreds and thousands of qualified counselors. You can have other students doing this stuff if you've got a very structured um, routine on the telephone. Um, and there's a manual that went with it. So it actually helped people to follow the process. And so it talked about things like, you know, cognitive restructuring and anxiety management, improving your sleep. And the primary outcome was to look at depression on a rating scale. And what was really striking was that there was a clear uh, improvement uh, in depression in Parkinson patients getting just telephone counseling. And more importantly, that improvement was seen out to six months. So in blue there at the top, you can see the people who didn't get any counseling, their level of depression hasn't changed. Whereas the guys who got counseling, their depression got less and stayed less. So I think that's really important. We're seeing improvements in mood. So when the doctors say to you, look, you have depression there, we need to get you a counselor. In actual fact, there's now good evidence to support that rather than just saying, well, you know, so we do. We actually now have evidence that counseling can help and, and persist. The other uh, study I wanted to highlight was the idea of using bright light therapy for depression in Parkinson's disease. So this, again, uh, is an interesting approach, no medications. Um, and basically, again, identifying patients with major depression with Parkinson's disease and asking them to use a light box. So effectively, a box that you literally put in front of your eyes that beams in um, bright light um, over a 10,000 lux versus a control light. Now, interestingly, I know it sounds like a big difference, but you can't tell whether you've got one or the other when you're looking into this box. And they gave three months of treatment and again looked at this depression rating scale, but showed there was no improvement in mood, but there was an improvement in sleep. So whether we can regulate people's sleep and that might have a benefit for their Parkinson's, not sure. Interestingly, there's another study that came out looking at yoga. 
Um, so yoga for mood disturbances. So essentially, this was a study looking at people doing yoga versus stretching exercises and showed that yoga in Parkinson's disease was better for anxiety, for depression and quality of life. So all of these non-drug treatments seem to have benefits. Sleep disorders. So for years, we've been telling people that what we should do um, is exercise to improve your sleep. And this is the first study that's actually looked at the benefits of exercise. So exercising three times a week for 16 weeks, giving some advice about uh, sleep hygiene on the telephone. And effectively what they showed was there's an improvement in sleep efficiency in those patients who are exercising. So not only physical benefits, but also sleep benefits. So I think these are, are really important, simple strategies that you can adopt today. This symptom many of you will be familiar with. This is called rapid eye movement sleep behavior disorder. Uh, about half of all Parkinson patients do this and basically they act out their dreams. So the whole way through this video, this patient is asleep. Um, and about a third of these patients will either injure themselves or injure their bed partner. So RBD, REM sleep behavior disorder, very common. And previously people have said, oh, look, we can treat this. We can treat this. You can use various tablets. Well, actually it doesn't look like that's the case. So this is one of the tablets, clonazepam, which is a sedative drug, a bit like temazepam or Valium. And this is a study from South Korea, my mate, uh, Byung-Shok John, BJ, um, which showed that clonazepam didn't improve this sleep disorder. And in actual fact, clonazepam is associated with making your memory worse and also causing problems with your balance. So I don't think we can advocate for clonazepam to help treat this dream behavior. And the other drug that people always talked about was melatonin. Um, so this is a study that I ran here in um, Sydney using slow release melatonin, which we thought would be good for this dream behavior. And in actual fact, it showed no benefit. So again, it doesn't look like melatonin can help with REM sleep behavior disorder. So at the moment, the advice is get a bigger bed, make sure there's, the bed environment is safe with nothing sharp. You can break if you fall out of bed or make sure there are pillows to stop you from punching out and hurting yourself or your partner. Pain, um, there is one study that looked at pain um, using a drug called duloxetine, it didn't show any improvements. Um, I think that was a bit too simple. Constipation, one of the biggest problems we see in Parkinson's. Two drug trials, both from Malaysia, looking at constipation in Parkinson's disease, using probiotics. Um, so this is the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of, if you like, using uh, the micro, microbiota in the microbiome. And what they showed in both of these trials was improvements in constipation using these multi-strain probiotics. So for many years, patients have said to me, oh, look, you know, do you think probiotics can help my constipation? The answer is it appears so. So in actual fact, it does look like you can actually improve constipation in Parkinson's using probiotics. Um, and this was done using a diary of how often people move their bowels. And um, as I say, there were two studies from Malaysia. I'm not quite sure Malaysia. I've never had any trouble with constipation when I visited Malaysia. But anyway, there were two studies from two separate centers showed exactly the same thing. I won't uh, talk about uh, Helicobacter pylori. Basically, people have said for years, maybe Parkinson's starts in the gut. And one of the questions was, well, maybe if we treated a, a, this, ant this um, bug that gets into your stomach, which... Funnily enough, as you know, the story was uh, described here in Australia by an, as, uh, an Adelaidean gastroenterologist uh, relating this bug to um, ulcers in the stomach. Uh, and people basically wanted to know, well, could we treat this bug that gets into the stomach and reduce the progression of Parkinson's? And the short answer was no, it doesn't seem to help. So treating Helicobacter pylori and Parkinson's doesn't seem to help. Bladder dysfunction. Um, so this is very common in Parkinson's disease patients. And there are two studies uh, we came out sort of similar times looking at bladder training. So essentially pelvic floor exercises plus coaching on, um, if you like, reducing the urge to, to empty your bladder. And both of these studies showed exactly the same thing. So if you do bladder training, this is not medications. They actually seem to improve the symptoms of urinary urgency and frequency. So I think these are promising studies. And again, no medications because a lot of the medications that we use in the bladder of Parkinson's can make cognition worse. So I think um, we're probably uh, in a point where we say to patients, look, if you've got bladder trouble, bladder training with a continent specialist is probably gonna be your first and best bet to start before we use any tablets. And the final thing I wanted to talk about was palliative care. 
And so palliative care is a topic that doesn't really get a lot of attention in Parkinson's disease because we think palliative care means you're about to die. Whereas the palliative care doctors are, are all about trying to improve the quality of your life. And so this was a study which basically was aiming to see whether if you supported patients with a team of palliative care experts who could talk to you about managing pain and anxiety and comfort, whether you would improve the, the outcomes for those patients in terms of their quality of life. Now, it's quite involved. As you can see, it's two and a half hours, palliative care, care neurologist, social workers, palliative care doctors. So seeing these patients with social workers to try and put everything in place. Um, and basically what they uh, did was to show <clears throat> that there's no doubt that actually having this extra level of support does improve um, the outcomes for those people who have a better quality of life, knowing that they've got that support in place. So I think this is something we, we don't want to ignore. And I think um, what I wanted to do then is just um, show you that uh, QR code again. So as I say, if you want to learn more about how to treat these non-motor symptoms rather than what we've talked about today, which is the, uh, the clinical trials that have given you new insights, then this QR code will take you to one of my lectures on my uh, website. Um, and with that, it reminds me to thank my team who are doing all the hard work um, so that I can come here today. So this is uh, 2017, celebrating the 200 year anniversary of the uh, essay on the shaking palsy describing Parkinson's disease by James Parkinson. And with that, I'll put up my final slide, which is if you wanted to see uh, more of my stuff um, with me talking to the camera about various symptoms, that's the QR code for my website. And with that, I will uh, unmute or rather allow people to see me and answer some questions. So very happy to uh, stop there and uh, take any questions from the room. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, that was a very quick run through um, uh, through uh, the, some of the most disabling symptoms that our patients and uh, sufferers face. Um, I don't know how you covered all of that uh, in 25 minutes. I think he was the only person who could do that. But we've got some, that means we've got some time for questions. He's um, covered a number of symptoms. So um, we would welcome questions from the floor. Anybody just raise your hands and we can run the mic through to you. Any questions on either sleep or any of those symptoms that he covered? Yes, it just seemed that there was uh, a lot of drugs that weren't effective in this video we saw. I'm wondering if there's a drug that really is effective and has been known and is effective ongoing. What symptom? Oh, the non-motor. Ah, well, the non-motor, unfortunately, you just saw, ranges from everything from cognition and dementia through to low blood pressure, through to bladder control. So really what you're talking about, which I haven't spoken about today, is some disease modifying treatment that would slow the progression of cell death because most of these features are associated with disease progression. Now, those trials are ongoing, and I can't remember on your program if you've got anyone speaking about this, but Victoria um, will have centres. And so effectively, there's a thing called the Australian Parkinson's Mission where we got $30 million out of the federal government um, to trial disease-modifying therapy. So we're using a repurposing approach. The first study um, is going to close at the end of this calendar year. The next study will start beginning of next calendar year. Um, and there'll be two centres. One, I think, is Royal Melbourne. and The other is the Alfred. So all of these studies are, are actually happening now. But I think in terms of, you know, a magic bullet that would stop all of these things, really what you're talking about is something that will slow the course of the disease. Thank you. I mean, we have another question here. Sure. Thanks, Professor. My question is about the REM, sleep disorder. Um, I understand there's no medication to assist with that, but is there any behavioural stuff, anything? Um, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, so bottom line is I think you need to make sure your patient doesn't have sleep apnea because sleep apnea can make it worse. Alcohol, especially late at night, can make it worse. Watching violent television and including that AFL and NRL um, because basically people act out the dreams that they're having. So having that late in the evening uh, seems to trigger these behaviours and make them worse. Anxiety makes it worse. And then in terms of 
the bed environment, the bigger the bed, if you're sharing a bed or two singles, um, and then nothing sharp or, or dangerous around the edge of the bed um, and a bolster that can go between you and your partner so they don't lash out and, and, and smack you on in the middle of the night. I mean, I've seen people break their neck jumping out of bed. I've seen people break somebody, their partner's nose. So these are real problems. I mean, one of the interesting things about RBD is that it can predate um, Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and actually, I've now launched the, the world's first study to target those patients with prodromal Parkinson's disease and working with a small biotech here and funding from Parkinson's UK with the idea of saying, OK, could we stop people from getting Parkinson's disease down the track? And, and that's, you know, the first of its kind. And we'll just have to see how that goes. But there'll be more of those studies, I'm sure. Uh, earlier on, you covered about the uh, uh, med medical chem study and medicinal cam cannabis. Uh, what about just CBD oil? Um, it doesn't seem to have as many side more effects. More side effects. More side effects. So basically, you get more of those side effects with, with street cannabis, CBD oil. So effectively, everything I've shown you is for medicinal cannabis, and you would anticipate um, that the number of side effects will be much higher in, in straight CBD oil. So, and the big one I would say is hallucinations. I mean, you saw it was 17%. So basically one in five patients will start hallucinating. They weren't hallucinating before they took medicinal cannabis. So I think you have to be very careful. I had one patient who, against my advice, um, went back to South Africa, uh, having had an opinion over here, went back, took uh, cannabis and was in hospital for three weeks with psychosis. All right, well, with the uh, um, full cannabis, you, you've got the uh, THC, which gives you the hallucinations but but you don't get it with the cbd it, it, it doesn't matter basically what happens is the cannabis gets broken down by the liver into these there are about 100 and plus cannabinoids and they they cross react with the cannabis cannabinoid receptors in the brain so all these people who think they're taking a clean product that's not going to give them a side effect as you just saw from that study in israel that's not true you get the side effects and you get them commonly okay thank you So I might just ask you a question, Simon. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the use of cholinesterase inhibitors and their benefit in dementia. Um, there hasn't been much work done on a mild cognitive impairment or MCI. I mean, after the Icicle PD study, uh, which laid out the criteria. So um, in Alzheimer's space, we have started using Souvenade, uh, which is a drink that, that seems to help and has got some data. What about in MCI with Parkinson's disease? Is Souvenade beneficial? Can we use it for our patients? So just to go back, um, people have done drug trials looking at cholinesterase inhibitors in PD-MCI. They don't work. Um, so despite the fact that it makes perfect sense, you should treat it earlier, in actual fact, using cholinesterase inhibitors in PDMCI doesn't help their cognitive impairment and doesn't stop them getting dementia. Um, the data on Souvenade, as you know, is a little bit controversial in the Alzheimer's space. They've never done a specific study in Parkinson's. I think the fact of the matter is that you have to be very careful in Parkinson's because you get a, a very large placebo effect with anything you use. So the fact of the matter is that we know from the drug trials and from the surgical studies that you will improve Parkinson's by about 35% for the first few weeks to months of any treatment, including a sugar pill. Um, and the reason is because the placebo effect is dopaminergic. And one of the big beefs I have at the moment is people saying, oh, you know, try this thing for a couple of weeks, then buy it. And you go, but the bottom line is that's going to be the period you get your, your placebo effect. So I think it's very hard to believe that, you know, some of these treatments will have more than that. And I think, you know, you have to wait until you get the data. The Souvenade data around Alzheimer's is, is you know, it's it's compelling, but not overwhelming, I'd say. Um, and, and we don't have that data in Parkinson's. Um, I was just curious to know, with all of those non-motor symptoms, um, would it stand to reason that the, the sooner that those uh, non-medication uh, treatments are instigated the better the outcome or the long you know the 
the longer the or the the delay, perhaps in those more sort of advanced symptoms of Parkinson's. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So every time I see someone and they're diagnosed, I say, look, you need to start investing in your own health now. You know, exercise is your best friend. Speech therapy is there. Counselling is there. There's online cognitive training programs that you can do. So there's a, there's absolutely no doubt. Kegels exercises. Women have been doing pelvic floor exercises postpartum for many years. All of these things getting good bowel habit. I mean, constipation can predate the physical symptoms. Um, and so, you know, trying to get all of those things right from the start, it, it makes perfect sense. Now, does it stop the disease progression? No. Will it slow the disease progression? Probably not. Will it limit the amount of the symptoms hit you as your disease progresses? Yes. So you're going to have a better quality of life. And so, you know, the fact of the matter is, and I say this, I don't know how many times in clinic, um, I will get on the elliptical machine every morning for an hour, smash myself stupid, burn a lot of calories. I may die of prostate cancer. It'll do me no good whatsoever. Whereas if you've got Parkinson's disease, you know you've got a condition that's going to respond to things like exercise and cognitive training and bowel training, all of those things. So in actual fact, you're only robbing yourself if you don't do these things early. Yeah, my question is, there's been a lot of work around the world in um, brain-computer interfaces, like the Neuralink in America. Is is there any potential in the future, do you think, with these devices with Parkinson's? I think that they will have some role. I mean, a lot of the AI stuff is looking at diagnosis and prediction, and the interface stuff is interesting, and probably the most sexy thing that's come out in the last couple of months um, is a spinal cord implant to help with gait. Now, that essentially is tuning into some very clever, um, if you like, engineering, but essentially trying to get people's um, stepping pattern to work um, from their own brain power, triggering a spinal cord stimulator. Now, that I think could be, you know, one way forwards where we'll see some of this stuff, but it's got to be translatable. So in actual fact, if it costs a million dollars to do one patient, it may never come into clinical translation. So it's it's a nice idea. And, and obviously it's a bit like, you know, mobile phones. They used to be this big and now, you know, they fit in your pocket and the technology has become much cheaper. So it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be working on this stuff because I think the chances are it will improve and it will presumably have some applications. Excellent. If there are no further questions, I would like to sincerely thank um, Simon, uh, Professor Lewis for his wonderful talk covering so many symptoms and it's very heartening to see the engagement from the floor. So keep your questions coming. Uh, we do have to keep to time, but we will always encourage questions, even if we run a little bit over. So thank you once again, Simon, and hope you can come back. Thank you so much.